It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Matthew Heffel um, as the first speaker today. Um, Matt did his undergrad at uh, Kansas State University as well as a uh, master's degree. Um, and in fact, he has already published a uh, very nice first author paper uh, as part of his master's thesis uh, doing modeling works for uh, um, insect control using uh, CRISPR gene drive. Um, and he has worked with, uh, earlier in his research training as an undergrad, he has worked on wet bench uh, with diverse species, including Arabidopsis, and he has concluded that doesn't fit with his taste. So he had um, transitioned to uh, doing computational biology and within uh, the just a very short one year in my lab, he has already generated a very large amount of data analysis with incredible quality. Um, I'm sure uh, he will tell you uh, about that. All right, so uh, like Chang-Yuan just said, my name is Matthew Heffel and I'm a second year bioinformatics PhD student, um, obviously in his lab. And before I say any more, I just want to thank everyone for uh, signing in to listen to this. I know it's uh, not as enticing without the free lunch we normally get. So I appreciate your time even more for showing up. Um, and so, yeah, again, like I said, I'm in the Luo lab and we do some really cool things in this lab, um, especially developing single cell epigenomic sequencing techniques. the ability to capture multiple modalities. Um, we have SNM3C seq where we can get both chromatin conformation and the methylome from every single cell. And more recently, we have SNMCT or SNMC2T seq where we can get uh, chromatin accessibility, the transcriptome, and the methylome all from the exact same cell. Uh, and Chang Yun likes to highlight these methods on really cool brain tissue and brain cells, which allows me to play around in the neuroscience space a bit. And thus, this presentation will be on the multimodal single cell epigenomic sequencing of the developing human cerebral cortex. So before we dive all the way into it, just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I just told you about the method we're going to use, SNM3CC, where we get chromatin conformation as well as the methylome from every single cell in our data. Um, I'm going to briefly go over those data modalities so everyone's familiar with the, exactly what we're working with. And then I'll tell you about the data set and what it's comprised of, followed by some pre-processing, dimensionality reduction, and clustering. Uh, and then we'll annotate our cells, look at some methylation trends and some cell type trajectories, followed by some differentially methylated regions and cell type correlations. And then we'll get into our other modality, the chromatin conformation, and also joint cluster that with the methylation to see what the multiple modalities look like together. Um, then we'll do some pseudo time analysis and then take a, a quick look at what some deeper uh, downstream analysis may look like. So uh, DNA methylation, um, that's one of our modalities and we're capturing this in each cell by whole genome by sulfite sequencing, where we're basically assessing uh, for any cytosine, is it methylated or is it not methylated? And so we're actually gonna split this into kind of two sub modalities here where we look at CG methylation and non-CG methylation. And I'll be referring to that as CH methylation, where H stands for uh, T, C, or A. And we actually will process this into not be looking at every single C site individually, but rather the uh, methylation fraction for 100,000 base pair bins across the genome, as well as gene body antigen. Is that uh, the accumulation of CH methylation is a hallmark uh, for developing neurons um, and also is very indicative of gene expression, and this is more so than CG methylation or other epigenomic modalities like ATAC-seq. Um, so our other modality is chromatin conformation capture, and this is going to give us information on the 3D genome and some long-range interaction exists in that molecular man. And what we do is we cross-link these chromatins, so and then we fragment up the DNA, repair the ends and ligate them, forming these little loops. Uh, and then we shear that again. And the result is we get these uh, chimeric reads where one end of the read maps to a specific region in the genome and the other end of the read maps somewhere entirely different. And so we know that these two distal genomic regions are closely um, located in the 3D genome space. So those are two modalities. Uh, now we'll look at what the data set is comprised of. Like I said, this is the human cerebral cortex 
We have 13 different samples or individuals and a few technical replicates across that, uh, which sums up to just over 30,000 cells for us. And you can see I have several different age groups there in that middle column. We're just gonna look at this in four major age group uh, clusters being our second trimester or mid gestation, which will be uh, gestation week 18, 20, and 23. We also have late gestation or third trimester of 35 and 39. Then we have two infant samples at four and seven months and several adults in red. And so um, with any data, we have gotta do some quality control and pre-processing. And so for the methylation end, we're gonna make sure that uh, our read mapping rate is greater than 50%. And that may sound low for anyone that doesn't really work with bisulfite reads, um, but this is actually a pretty standard uh, minimum rate for read mapping and methylation. Um, further, we're going to make sure that our global CH methylation rate in our cells is less than 20%, and our global CG methylation rate is greater than 50%. And then on our chromatin conformation modality, we're going to make sure each cell has greater than 100,000 interactions. We also filter our features by mean coverage, a little bit different for gene bodies in 100,000 base pair bins. Um, but the result of this is we've removed just over 1,000 cells and uh, end up with about 102,000 features per cell. And um, we also have to do a little bit of imputation across low coverage features that uh, occur in some cells. Um, now, once we do our quality control, we get a little bit into the processing step where we do dimensionality reduction. Obviously, 102,000 features is too many to work with. So through principal component analysis, we reduce this into linear combinations of our 102,000 variables, and we end up with about 50 um, features now. Um, and actually, these start to degrade into noise very rapidly. So we only take like the top 20 principal components that are um, very explanatory of the variance in our data set. And with these, we uh, make a k-nearest neighbor graph, which allows us to do unsupervised clustering through lead-in as well as further dimensionality reduction through UMAP, um, bringing our 20 principal components down to two dimensions because we're humans and two dimensions makes a lot more intuitive sense to us than some high dimensional mathematical mayhem. Um, so now we've generated a UMAP on our data set and all I've done here, uh, we see our general UMAP structure and I've overlaid our age group annotations on top of it. And so you can see there in the left middle, we have our second trimester cells uh, in navy blue and as our uh, age group grows older to light blue third trimester, cyan, infant, and red adult, you can see how we expand out to the peripheral adult cell types. Um, something I'm gonna point out right now is we have a few of these uh, cell types right here that are comprised of multiple age groups. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so what we do wanna do next is annotate these cells into what they actually are. And so we do this by our CH hypomethylation and some of the knowledge we've already talked about. So for the first thing we do is we see uh, our global CH accumulation here for all of our UMAP. And we can see down here, these are some red cell types on our age UMAP that are not gaining CH methylation. So we know right there that these are some kind of non-neurons. Um, further, we have hypomethylation here up on this node of uh, the LHX6 gene. And so we're able to annotate that cell type as our medial ganglionic eminence derived cells. And then again, here we have a DARB2 hypomethylation. We can annotate that as our caudal ganglionic eminence derived cells. Uh, it's not really worth our time. It's very redundant to go through every single marker gene, but through these methods, we can annotate our major cell lineages. I just told you about the ganglionic eminence derived cells in blue and purple there, but we also have radial glia from our second trimester group in pink, as well as our upper layer excitatory neurons in gray and our deep layer excitatory neurons in green. And then we have our glial non-neurons, which uh, also develop from radial glia in red there. And then our non-glial non-neurons in brown, which were those cell types that had multiple age groups within them. And those are derived from other parts of the body, not in the brain or radial glia. So with these uh, major cell type annotations, we can already do a little bit of analysis here, which is gonna be slightly confirmatory of things I've already told you. Um, but in our top left, we can just look at global CH accumulation by major lineage. Um, and you can see our deep layer, upper layer, and our ganglionic eminence derived cells all begin to gain CH uh, methylation accumulation. And that uptick starts right around there, gestation week 35 in our third trimester. And then by infancy, we've gained uh, much more significant CH methylation. And by the time we're adults, we've gained even more CH methylation. Um, also, like I said, we know that non-neurons do not gain CH methylation in the same way. 
So these two non-neuronal types, uh, red and brown, aren't gaining CH, me CH methylation like the rest of our major lineages, though we do notice that our glial non-neurons have a slight uptick of CH methylation relative to the non-glial non-neurons. Uh, we can do a similar analysis on the CG global methylation, and while the differences are not as stark as CH methylation, we do see some slight rearrangements on the global CG methylation, notably the ganglionic eminence-derived inhibitory neurons um, do gain more CG methylation across the entire genome than some of the other major lineages. Now we can also look at CG methylation over gene bodies, kind of like we looked at hypomethylation for the uh, uh, annotations. And we can see that among our major lineages, I have five pulled out there on the bottom, that CG methylation is either going up or down at differential rates across these major lineages for different um, specific genes that we know of. Um, we don't really need to dig too far into this, just again, acknowledging that we see CG uh, arrangements occurring differently by major lineage. So what we for cells, and UMAP starts to get really messy at this point. Uh, but one thing I want to point out on this slide is we have this light blue cluster here that I've annotated layer one through three by CUX2. And you can see how this cell type uh, exists along major different age groups. And so we'll start to get into how cell types differentiate and diverge at different time points uh, throughout our developmental uh, clusters. And so I have a much more intuitive view of what's happening here in a developmental river plot um, where the river flows are colored by the major lineages we just talked about. So from our radial glia, we have um, our non-neurons developing here, which are glial non-neurons, our astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. We have our uh, upper layer neurons in gray here developing into their seven different terminal cell types we've identified. And then in green, we have our deep layer neurons, which is cortical layer six, as well as our near projecting cells. And then we have our ganglionic eminence derived cells, which we know don't come from radial glia down here at the bottom in blue and purple. Um, something we notice here is that we have a few of our third trimester ganglionic eminence derived cells cluster with our second trimester ones, um, but we also know that they will eventually further develop into the more aged um, regular ganglionic eminence cells we see in the rest of that age group. So uh, now we're going to get into some pseudobulk and differentially methylated region calling. And uh, for anyone unfamiliar, we do this method called pseudobulk because single cell is often very sparse and low coverage. So we get about 10% of the genome coverage uh, per cell, and the depth is only one. So uh, what we would want to do is get more coverage per cell type. So say we have 50 astrocytes in our infants. Uh, we aggregate all of these 50 astrocytes into one like pseudoastrocyte. And now if each of those astrocytes had 10% coverage, we have one pseudoastrocyte with 500% coverage in about a genome depth of five at any given position. And so what I've done in this uh, graph we see is called just the top 1000 uh, differentially methylated regions, which these can be as small as like five base pairs long by their ability to uniquely identify this given cell type and age group stratification. And you can see there clearly across the diagonal that we have a significant number of DMRs that are able to uniquely identify uh, these age group and cell type um, stratifications. Um, also worth pointing out, we can see some parallels of uh, shared DMRs between the adult and infant cell types. Um, and that makes sense because these cells are developing into their adult cell type. And so some of these DMRs are going to have already occurred by infancy and so on. And so another similar analysis we have is the correlation of each cell type and age group stratification. And there are three major blocks here that I'm gonna talk about. The first one there in the upper left corner is our second and third trimester cell groups, uh, very highly correlated with themselves. Um, but we also see a second block in the middle, which is the infant and adult cell types. And the fact that these two blocks exist somewhat separately is very indicative that there are major genomic rearrangements occurring between third trimester and infancy that is gonna change how these cells uh, differentiate. Um, within that infant and adult cell type, I again wanna point out the same thing we talked about, where here we have our infant ganglionic eminence cell types, and here are the same cell types of adult, and we see these uh, tangent overlapping correlations between the same cells of infant and adult cell type. And again, the same thing occurs for our excitatory neurons. Here we have the infant and down here in the adult, and we again see our, our tangent peripheral overlapping correlations. And then further in the bottom right of this map, we have all of our non-neurons, which have significantly low correlation to our infant and adult excitatory and inhibitory neurons. But when we get all the way to the 
uh, top right and bottom left, we see high correlation when we look back to our second trimester and third trimester cells. And this makes sense because we already talked about how non-neurons don't gain CH methylation and these second and, tri and third trimester cells haven't yet gained their CH methylation. So they are correlating on all of the lack of CH methylation there. So now we'll finally get into the other mod modality we have, which is our chromatin conformation. And we've done a lot of the same similar steps here where I've made the UMAP and I overlay our age group annotations here. And you can see again, our navy blue second trimester cells and then how those kind of develop in a trajectory to light blue to cyan and to red as they're adults. Uh, and then on the left, again, we see shared age groups among our non-neuronal cells. Um, however, when we look down to our major lineage annotation, while the non-neurons stay very well separated, our deep and upper layer excitatory neurons are starting to mix together as well as our two ganglionic eminence derived clusters. And then further, when we move to the right map with all these colors that are mixing together, we can see that chromatin conformation doesn't have near the ability that methylation does to intricately identify cell types. Uh, this is okay, there's still advantages to having this other modality and we're about to get to that. Um, what we're gonna do next is joint cluster our two modalities. Um, this is as simple as merging the principal components from each modality. Um, just simply put here, you can see in the middle our joint principal components, and it's especially noticeable to see how they're taking on uh, features from both of our modality spaces, especially in PC3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, not worth looking at this too in depth, but uh, we build our joint UMAP that we see here in the middle. Um, and there is one major thing I want to point out here. I've circled a cluster here on our left in brown, which is our radial glia cell type. Um, and in methylation, that's only one cell type. But when we move to our joint clustering, we can see it start to diverge into two different cell types. And looking at our chromatin conformation UMAP, this one single cell type identified by methylation is completely separated to what we have as our major radioglia cell type group. And the small subgroup that's way over here with non-neurons, actually that yellow cluster is astrocytes. So we can tell what was only identified by methylation or what was only identified by radioglia and methylation clearly has some subgroup that is a, a developing type of non-neuron. And we'll move forward to validate that in a bit, but it's like the chromatin conformation is giving um, So now we're gonna get to some pseudo time analysis to kind of validate this. Um, and what I've done is I've taken our medial ganglionic eminence derived cells to do this. And I want to point out real quick on the age UMAP how we can see some of our third trimester cells are clustering with the second trimester cells. And that's going to be a very notable part of what's happening here. But for anyone unfamiliar with pseudo time, what this is going to do is assign each cell a developmental time point relative to where it is on its developmental trajectory, which may or may not be different from its actual age group metadata that we've had at the very beginning. So you basically make a root node in our second trimester EMGE cell group and then terminal nodes in all of our adult cell types. And again, like I said, each cell is then assigned a relative developmental time point on their trajectory. So we've done this for um, this uh, medial ganglionic eminence derived group on both CG methylation as well as chromatin conformation. And the major takeaways we wanna point out here is first, if you look at our light blue background groups here, most of our development is occurring by infancy, um, showing that uh, 3T or between the third trimester and infancy is a pretty pivotal developmental time point. Um, further, we can validate that the chromatin conformation is giving us a relative forward developmental time step to methylation by looking at our third trimester cells in the chromatin conformation as opposed to methylation. You can see these violins are much more top heavy, um, where in the methylation, they're more bottom skewed and as well as just our, even our second trimester cells are already starting to get towards their developmental trajectories um, that early on. You can see that on the violin pseudo time plots. So um, now we wanna take a look into some of the deeper level analysis we can do with these modalities because what I've shown so far is really just higher level abstractions. But what a lot of people are inter interested in is what's happening in the genome um, for developmental uh, changes or maybe the difference between species um, or different um, organisms entirely, or maybe even healthier disease cell types. So on the left, I've pulled up the genome tracks for this specific MEF2C um, gene that we know is highly involved in uh, neuronal development. And we have it covered for all of our different age groups. And you can see clear uh, demethylation across this MEF2C gene body 
as we start from our second trimester and move towards our terminal adult cell type. And then further on the right, we have a visualization of our chromatin conformation. Um, and anyone familiar with these maps, every red dot represents a distal uh, chromatin interaction. And so obviously there across the diagonal, uh, adjacent linear genomic regions are gonna have a lot of 3D genome interactions. Um, and you can see kind of expanding blocks. There are some topologically associated domains. But the main point we want to point out is we have our second trimester map on the left and our adult cell type on the right. And we're having some clear genomic interactions being gained in the 3D genome between our second trimester and adult cell type, again, on this MEF2C locus. Um, so now that's uh, pretty much the bulk of the presentation. Just to reiterate kind of what we went over, I talked about SNM3C seq for uh, multimodal epigenetic sequencing. We looked at the clustering algorithms and how this analysis is done, as well as some methylation changes in the developing cortex and some 3D genomic rearrangements that are occurring. I also pointed out how uh, the chromatin conformation gives us a bit of a temporal forward step relative to the methylation, while the methylation is able to give us much more robust cell type annotation as opposed to the chromatin conformation. And we use some pseudotimes to kind of validate this. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody who's been helping me on this project. Obviously, my PI, Chang Yuan Luo, the big brains behind everything happening in our lab. And we also have Yi, who runs our wet lab, does a lot of really cool things that I don't fully understand or can do. Uh, Kevin also helps us out in the wet lab and did a lot of work on this project. We had a rotating graduate student who's a first year in bioinformatics PhD, Terence, who did a lot of the work on the chromatin conformation modality. And we have several um, collaborating professors at other UC universities, Mercedes, Tom, and Aaron. And we have regular meetings with these people who um, I like to show them some of the annotations I made. And they tell me when it doesn't make any biological sense. So I can go and correct that before I get to the point where I present to you and I'm able to um, not make a fool of myself, hopefully. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for again, spending their time to listen to my talk. And I guess I can open the floor to questions now for anyone that may have some.